Michael Macari is a 30 year veteran of the television and music industries. A multi award winning writer and producer, Michael has produced and written over 1,000 TV and video programs and over 600 live events worldwide. His latest book, The Star of Bethlehem, the epic story of the birth of Christ, was recently published by Trilogy Christian Publishing. And here to talk about that and so much more is Michael Macari. Welcome to the program, Michael. Thank you very much, Mike. Thank so, Mike. Oh, my pleasure to have you here. So uh, I always like to say that this podcast, the show is really about uncorking the stories behind the story. So I, I'm curious, Michael, where does your where does your story begin? Uh, in Stanford to immigrant parents, uh, Italian on my father's side, Greek on my mother's side, very traditional, uh, loved it, loved the upbringing, miss it today. I would say that uh, the, the inspiration from, from my professional beginnings my father used to share in the 60s, uh, introduce me to biblical epics on television. You know, they were on once a year. Oh, yeah. King of Kings, Ben-Hur. His favorite was Quo Vadis, which was the first of the big biblical epics. I think it was 1951, Ten Commandments with Charlton Heston. Um, the Robe, Demetrius and the Gladiators. They were all biblical pieces and they were... They had Miklos Rosa soundtracks. They were rich, they were wonderful. And I loved them. And somewhere deep inside as a kid, I always wanted to make the story of Christmas, just Christmas. Because there was a Christmas scene in Ben-Hur, a Christmas scene in King of Kings, but just the story of Christmas from beginning to end. And as the story goes, um, I got into the video and television business in, in the early 80s after a stint in the music world and um, actually about 10 years in started writing a screenplay, started researching and writing a screenplay. I was in a position where I thought I could have the influence to do it and gather the resources. I started researching something about the birth, everything from what the cave might have looked like, the manger and uh, timelines for oriental magi to get to jerusalem from or bethlehem from persia and kept that file intended as a screenplay for about 30 years and didn't open it until after a bout i had last year with covid mm -hmm. and the covid bout i turned around i found the file it was yellowed and i started thinking about it and i wondered if now was the time yeah and um, so it was one of these, Lord, if you're with me and you help me write this, I'll do this. And if I'm doing this by myself, I have no interest. <laughs> well, um, uh, and little by little, there were days nothing came. There were other days that it flowed. And uh, over about six months, all of a sudden, I found myself pitching it to a publisher and got Trilogy Publishing, which is a division of TBN, mm -hmm. Trinity Broadcast Network. Uh, they were generous and interested. and. Uh, published the book the story yeah. of Bethlehem. yeah yeah which which i know came out uh available for sale as of black friday uh not, not a bad on sale date for you <laughs> all they're doing they had a great marketing team i always say you know books make great gifts uh, for anybody who's listening but uh i mean right i mean 17 dollars, 19 24 dollars. how could you go wrong when you're out there looking for something for somebody i just think and and based on the the attendance that i saw at a book signing last week we did here in New Canaan, Connecticut. The the crowds, there's a lot of people and they're spending money. Yeah. They were, you know, they they might have gone in there for one book and they came away with eight. Yeah. 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 Well, you know, before we talk about more about the book, I want to talk about the 30 year gap. I mean, you, you started writing it um, you know, it's 30 years ago or so. What what was kind of going on in between? So what was you know, what were you doing in between sort of starting that screenplay and then obviously finishing it during during COVID, um, help, help fill in the gaps for me. I, uh, around 1983, 84, in the infant days of what was to be known as the video industry, I and some partners got together and we formed a company. Our company was local, it was called Eagle Vision. It took us all over the world. We were doing corporate communications, live events, documentaries, concerts, TV all over the place. Uh, I think it was 29 countries, um, wonderful documentaries. And so that was the backdrop 
probably 10 years in or so, I started thinking about what we could do in the areas of original programming and studio production and some of the things that we gave birth to ourselves rather than being hired to as a production company. Um, and that was one of them. And I don't know why from the early onset, the birth of Christ, it was called for me, the star of Bethlehem. And the real star not being that thing that was in the heavens, but being he who was born in the manger. And so we were, we were hard at work. We were operating a post-production facility here in Stanford. We were keeping busy with a lot of projects in a seminal time in the industry. Uh, the industry started changing a little bit. Maybe late 90s was going digital, was changing, you know, by the mid 2000s, you started knowing that real change was coming. Even cell phones became our competitors. When we first got in the business, it was a quarter of a million dollars so to put in an editing system and, and beta decks and digital. And now virtually kids could make a movie, you know? And I started being asked by customers, can you just come with your cell phone? So I knew the industry was changing. We stayed in as long as we thought it was viable. There were some changes in my life uh, the last seven years, I had to get involved in a family business and some properties and estates, all things I had a background for, but things that took me away from what I had been doing for 30 years. Sure. I've written as a writer consistently some from the mid seventies in music or marketing till today. Yeah. So it's just maybe it seems the industry changes. I don't know. As as a music guy, I have to ask. T tell me about the your your going back to the seventies. You're you're writing. Uh, are you talking lyrics? Are you talking songs or? Yeah, uh, definitely lyrics to songs. Definitely music to songs. Uh, materials around them. Um, doing marketing, copy design for album covers and things like that. Um, in the mid seventies, it was a real arena era the Led Zeppelins and Genesis and Moody Blues and Jethro Tulls and on and on and on were all playing arenas and, uh, and, and beginning stadium tours. On the local level, clubs, concerts, colleges, bands that were on the way up, almost like the minor leagues, were recording music, were performing in front of sometimes large crowds and festivals, and often with their own heroes in the, in, the, uh, in the audience. It was not uncommon for us to run into guitarists and singers and drummers from well-known top bands that were there watching us. And we were in the studio as much as we could. Excuse me. Like anybody had to balance 240 performing dates a year with trying to find time to get in the studio. And it was an era where really the creative era of original pop music was coming to an end. That thing that began in the 50s or maybe 60s through the Beatles and all the bands that came after, it was coming to an end and it wasn't creativity or radio access anymore. It was being engineered in the corporate studios and that type of stuff. We didn't seek to get out but we lived in a 21 room <coughs> um, old Mediterranean mansion on four acres of lawn. It was a, an old halfway house for actors that were vaudeville people. Perfect for a rock and roll band and its crew. Built a studio. One day we were up in Massachusetts doing a weekend of gigs and um, the house burned to the ground. Uh, it was arson and it changed our lives. Yeah. Where, where was so, the house? Where was this mansion? Actually, it was at, if, if you know, in Stanford, if you know where Trinity Catholic is, if you went toward lower, if you were going south on Newfield Avenue, there's a street today that's called ben, Denicola Place. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. It has five houses on it. Yep. Once that house was taken down, those houses were built. Okay. So it was only a block or so from Trinity Catholic High. But it was, it was the, it was home base for a rock band and its guests. And, and I've I wrote that in the book, uh, the boomers that I wrote, I, I wrote that in the book because it was so much a part, the life was so much a part of it. It was worth recounting 
so to speak. But it also at that point propelled all of us into, you know, where do we go from here if it's not the music business? And most got married and found jobs. Many continued playing music or making music. I got involved in the video and television industry for 30 years. Yeah. From- so you had a little bit of rock and roll lifestyle for a bit, and then um, things change, and you go into uh, go into I don't want to say the real world, but um, you know you you have a grown up job, if if you will. Um, who you know you mentioned you know as part of that video production company that uh, you you're filming some bands and concerts. Who and uh, any names you could drop? Uh, who, who you filmed? Uh, there was a um, at that time it was a big there was a growing contemporary Christian market out of Nashville. And as those artists were touring, the Sandy Patties and Amy Grants and Phil Driscoll's and, and uh, Mylon Lefebvre's and Carmen and Michael W. Smith, they would tour when they would branch out into the East Coast, we would catch up to them and do live performance videos for the record companies. As years went on, a lot of the original bands from the sixties, like, um, uh, the Association, Judy Collins, um, Gary Puckett in the Union Gap, uh, Tommy James in the Shondells, uh, Chad and Jeremy. Uh, a lot of those bands started hitting the road again with younger players. But again, they needed DVDs and they needed merchandise to sell. And we were kind of involved in that. I was involved in the, in the early days of a guy from Greenwich named Rob Mathis. Mm-hmm. Rob is a world-class talent. We saw it early on with his first locally released CD, got involved with him, did a couple of PBS shows, got involved with people like Vanessa Williams, David Sanborn, Michael McDonald of the Doobie Brothers, Ossie Davis. And it just kind of parlays, you know, it, it, uh, it parlays into the level of work that you do. And then eventually toward the end of my video career, I would say six, seven years ago, we played seven nights in a 14,000 seat arena in Spain during World Youth Day and produced a 75,000 person show at the Coliseum in Los Angeles. So it, it ran the gamut from, you know, where you started to where we, uh, you know, to where we ended up. Sure. Sure. Um, you know, you know, it's, it's interesting, you know, I hear, you know, rock and roll, right? 60s, 70s, and you're, you're kind of living that life mansion you know i can only imagine some of the things that were happening in that in that mansion read the book <laughs> yeah I will, I will definitely read the book and uh, it's probably a good thing that 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 and it did burn down because if those walls could talk i'm sure there's some some interesting stories they tell but i hear that and then i hear you know this this you know drive to write a story you know about the star of bethlehem and, and the birth of christ and and to some they might think hey you know what's what's the connective tissue between that i mean they they seem could be, uh, you know, at odds with each other, no? You know, I've actually been asked that question before, uh, and I think it's a fair one. Um, but, you know, we, we were all kids. I grew up in the 60s. It was a different time. Yeah, you know, I mean, I can say I was alive and very conscious of civil unrest and Kennedy's assassination. I can tell you where I was and, and uh, Woodstock and the Beatles, and it, it was a wonderful time, even though I was probably four or five years too young to enjoy it on, a, you know, on the level that a lot of people enjoyed it. But when we got into rock and roll and everything about that rock and roll scene is what is what people think it is. When we were writing the book, we asked ourselves the question, do we tell it in detail or do we homogenize it a little bit because we have kids? And yeah. we decided to tell the story honestly, but not get too graphic. And so those that's the same group of people. When you were a teenager, you were a certain kind of kid and interested in certain things. When you got involved in rock and roll and serious endeavor rock and roll, it brought out of you what was in you. And yeah, the, you know, you, people could say the bad boy stuff. But we often say that we weren't bad enough to live in a bathtub with a needle hanging out of our arm as some Rock and Roll Hall of Famers were. God bless them. They did it. They made it. But I think we were kids from good immigrant families who happened to be extremely talented and and gelled as a band in in a really unusual way. But, you know, the fates 
the fates don't let you, sometimes the fates have other plans for you. So when I was in video and TV, when I ended up there after music, I was in the craft and I really thought about that, that thing that was inside me, that seed about writing. And I didn't know whether to start the Christmas story as a screenplay, as a book, I didn't know, how, but so I started writing it the only way I know, which is somewhere of a hybrid. It was, it was graphically and dialogue wise, it, it almost had an air of fiction to it. But at the same time, it was well-researched, historically accurate, and, and, and it, it took the form that it did. It sat dormant for 30 years because it was never because of the volume of projects we worked on, there was never a window or the funding. I mean, you know what it would take to do it. Imagine what it would take to do Ben Hur today. Oh, sure. I don't even know how much money. And I and I would have never done it on the cheap because why? You know? Yeah. So when you're when you're researching it, you're looking through all the, the history of it all. Um, you know, where we're yeah, you grow up, you, you mentioned kind of being an immigrant. Uh, household Italian Greek. I'm Italian Irish, which means I'm Catholic. Uh, but yeah, exactly. you know, you, yeah. But you know, you, you're you're we're we're taught, you know, from and I went to Catholic schools, so you know, we're we're taught, you know, from a very young age, you know, the story of of the the birth of Christ. You know, the three wise men or the three wise guys, as some people call them. But <laughs> yeah, yeah, the gold, the frankincense, the myrrh, the 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 manger, um, no room at the inn, all of that. Um, what did you learn? doing your research that that surprised you? Um, did you learn anything that surprised you about uh, about the story? I learned there were some things that were traditional that might have over time taken on the traditional appearance, but might not have started that way. For example, In an Italian household, a lot of times my father, my immigrant father would build a manger scene with the fake snow and the, and the cardboard mountains and the, and, the, and, the, um, and the villagers and the shepherds and the three kings and, the, and, and it was this thing that took up a whole table and he did it every year. It was respectful, it was reverent, it was traditional. But the manger was a wooden structure it had these two sides and then it had a roof like this. It was a wooden structure. When I had a chance to go to the Holy Land, uh, maybe 20 years ago, when you go to the, the, the church of Jesus' birth, which is in Bethlehem, which is Palestinian today, the church that's built over the grotto, in 20 steps, you're there. It is a cave. It is rock. It's probably only, tw it's probably about the twice the size of this office. It's maybe 25 by 40. You could with your hand touch the ceiling of this cave and the wax of millennia of candles, the wax, there's probably an inch of wax on those rocks, but it's a cave. And when you start reading the different interpretations of the Bible and the historical figures, I got a sense that it was a cave used for the sheltering of animals that had a little wood overhang on it, almost like a porch mm -hmm. for the movement of these animals in and out. And so I understood how a cave with a wood overhang became a wooden thing called the manger. And so when I was writing, that's what I built into this. And one of the illustrations I had done was of this. That means that they were inside a cave. There could have been animals there. What did they do for light? You know, you start, you start, you start playing this out in your mind of, were they alone? Did any of the townspeople come and help her give birth? Did anybody bring water or, or linens? Did anybody help them at all? Did they bring them food? How long could they have stayed there? You know, probably from your Catholic upbringing that the three kings came to the manger. Well, I started realizing that maybe they didn't. 
Little Christmas is celebrated 14 days, 15 days after Christmas in most Spanish countries. How long did it take the Magi to get there? Did it just so happen? It was a thousand mile journey. Did they just so happen to be there on that exact day that he was born? The new, the King James Version of the Bible says that when the kings arrived, they went and saw the child with its mother in the house, in the house. And I thought to myself, would people of that town, some of which were relatives of Joseph, would they have let this, this woman and her newborn child stay in a damp manger? It didn't make sense to me. Yeah. And so when I was writing the book, I had them after the day of the birth, I had them entertained, you know, given this courtesy by some townspeople and they moved to a house of a relative. And it's kind of weird when the Kings with their camels and stuff are plodding down the street and they stop at 222 Bethlehem drive, <laughs> you know, but it made sense to me. And people are telling me that have read the book that it breathes to them, like they feel that they're there. And nobody has said to me, a lot of Catholics, nobody has said to me, how could you write that when you know tradition says this? And I think that was pervasive and it came from the research because there's the biblical accounts and translations and the Old Testament you know, uh, forebodings. There's the historical writings. There's the anecdotal writings. There's traditionals and tr tradition. So I think what the Star of the Bethlehem in is, is everything kind of put together in a cohesive beginning through end, as I, as I saw it in that research. Yeah, yeah. you know, it, it, and also I have, to, I have to point out, you know, a way in a manger flows off the tongue better than a way in a cave. <laughs> um, Absolutely. As a, as a lyricist, you'd probably agree. Yeah. Um, you know, I, what I, one thing I'm curious about also is uh, the star and, and sort of evidence of, of the star. Because, and I'm asking because I, I remember years ago when my kids were young, I took them to the Stanford Museum and Nature Center where somebody from their like astronomy division was putting put together a presentation on, you know, the star of, of Bethlehem and, and actually using star charts to actually kind of actually map it out. And he was able to, to do it. Now, the timeline didn't match up 100%, um, you know, with, you know, uh, you know, year one AD. Um, but I'm curious, did you learn anything about, like, the, you know, evidence of an actual celestial event in the sky during that period of time? I grew up believing that it was a miraculous event on the level of the parting of the Red Sea, an intervention by God. I grew up believing that. As I got older, I heard, well, maybe it was a comet, you know? Um, you know, do you hear what I hear? The Christmas song, do you hear what I hear? With a tail as big as a kite, was, was it a comet? What could it, could it have been other things? So I, I grew up with this sometime in the, I also, maybe 15, 18 years ago, my daughter, Joey and I, uh, I let her skip school and we went to the Hayden Planetarium in New York, in the Bronx. And they had a show in December called The Star of Bethlehem. And, and Ernest Martin wrote a book that's called The Star That Astonished the World. And in those two concepts, they say that they can use computers today to tell you exactly what the sky looked like on any given day in history. You know, there are, there are those people that say Jesus was born in 4 BC. Some people say it's the lead is 1 AD. Whatever it was, we can calculate certain things. And in Ernest Martin's book, in his research, and in the, and in the Star of Bethlehem and the Hayden Planetarium that played in planetariums all over the country, they talked about a star, a, a planet, and then they call it Jupiter. And they say that Jupiter had a rendezvous with a king star called, a uh, star called Regulus. And this Regulus actually went in retrograde and circled it above it, creating celestially to an astronomer a halo. And it ended up in Virgo, the Virgin, and that it was announcing in the heavens that the king was having, like a, a, a baby king was going to be born. Mm -hmm. It fascinated me. 
And I thought to myself, well, that's not taking God out of it. That's the just incredible, unbelievable awesomeness of God. And so the Magi, there, there were men that were ast astrologer, astronomer, rich, rich people in Persia in the day would hire these men to discern the stars and tell them what was going to happen to their crops and what was going to happen to their business dealings and give them insights from the heavens. And they were paid handsomely for that. That's why we often see the, the, the three kings dressed as they were called kings, dressed the way they were. And they made this trip. They saw something. They saw these movements in the heavens enough that three of them got together and said, let us go see what this is all about. And they traveled, it could have been months, through some pretty tough terrain to keep following this star, which kept getting brighter as this convergence was happening until what they think was three stars came together and it would have been the brightest thing in the night sky in the entire Middle East and in the entire Southern Hemisphere. And that worked for me. The, the star which went ahead of them in the east, you know, if you understand from Persia to Jerusalem, they would be traveling south and southwest. When they got to Jerusalem, they'd be going south, southeast to go to Bethlehem, the star which went before them in the east. And I found it fascinating connecting the dots of these things. So my star is a celestial happening that is tracked by people who know and was seen by potentially millions of people. Yeah. And it's the only time in human history that a star announced someone's birth. Yeah, it's uh, it's fascinating. And, you know, I think we, we you know, we're taught, you know, uh, that it's, it's wonderful and we're almost expected to take things on faith. But when you can find some some evidence, you know, it's uh, it's so tempting not to want to follow your nose and and kind of confirm the things that you're you know, taught to, to take on faith. Amen. You know, I never once saw anything that contradicted anything. It was the opposite. It was over and over and over again. It was, oh my God, oh my God. Even when you started on the biblical side, it was a, it was a wonderful adventure to be able to follow the, to compile the Old Testament scriptures a star will rise, a scepter will not depart from Bethlehem. All the, 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 the stories, the stories that were written by the Jeremiah's and, I, and Isaiah's and King David, and maybe go back as far as in Genesis. And when you see them all together, and then you put them in a chronology, and you marry that up with the New Testament, the chronology over several thousand years is just you stand in all of it, you know, I, I would love the opportunity to do it again. Yeah. You know, I, I, another thing I'm curious about, um, you know, we talk about the star, we talk about, um, you know, obviously the manger and, and where it took place uh, in terms of, um, you know, timing, uh, you know, were you able to, to ascertain like what time of year this may have happened? I think we believe, you know, Christmas obviously is when we celebrate it. It's December 25th. Um, but I've always heard that, you know, when, there, when there's talk of shepherds in the field, you know, they probably wouldn't be in the field in, in December. Um, did you learn anything about, about when during the year this may have taken place? I went with December 25th because it coincided with, or, or thereabouts, it coincided with the Israeli feast of Hanukkah, a feast of lights, and Saturnium which was a Roman holiday at the time, honored the emperor. And it was around the solstice. I did not, I did not have a problem with, this, with the shepherds being out in the fields because the lambs and the sheep have to eat all year long. Mm -hmm. It's not a place that gets a lot of snow. It would probably get very cold, but you know, the people had flocks and they had to do something with them. The shepherds that I have are people who take the flocks for people out into the fields and then bring them back. And that's how they're paid for it. And 
Bethlehem being the house of bread, I, I also envision them having a fairly robust wheat trade or bread trade, you know, the grain, they're six miles from Jerusalem. I envision that there would be some wealthy people selling grain in Jerusalem. A lot of the environs, um, it, it would have been, they wouldn't be picking tomatoes at this time. But I think December, the whole tradition and at the end of a year and everything, I just left it. There's no way I could prove that it was April or that it was June. I couldn't prove that, nor could I prove, some people say it took the, the Magi two years to travel a thousand miles. Mm -hmm. I, I envisioned it more as months that they were traveling. I envisioned it as weeks for Joseph and Mary to get from 70 miles away in Nazareth. Um, but I stuck with, I stuck with the season. Okay. Uh, another thing I'm curious about, I'm just curious about so many things, um, uh, is, uh, uh, King Herod. So, you know, where, you know, every, every story, you know, needs to have a, a protagonist and an antagonist and, and, and the stories that we've been told, um, kind of growing up is that King Herod is, is an antagonist here, kind of, you know, threatened by, uh, the, the coming of a new king and um, kind of leading up into the, the, you know, the slaughter of the innocents. And, and there's even part of the, the story where you know, he is talking to the Magi and, and saying, hey, find, you know, this new king so that I may, I may come and worship him too. And of course, the, the Magi are, are told in a dream not to, um, to, to sort of circumvent their, their way home. Um, did you learn anything about King Herod? And does he fe feature, you know, into, into uh, this book? Uh, yes and yes. Um, King Herod would have been maniacal. He would have been, uh, his father was incredibly creative. Uh, I've been to Masada in, in Israel, built on a thousand foot cliff just magnificent aqueducts and cities that he built in the, on the he just was a tremendous engineer he knew how to move water but he died and he left it to a son you know I, I, I sometimes I have little faith in the next generation because they did nothing to earn anything and you know it is said that he um, that he killed his wife it is said, said that he took up with his brother Phillips this is in the Bible said that he, it, that he took up with his brother Philip's wife. Um, he, the, the story of Christmas takes place according to the book of Luke. Uh, I, the specifics of it, it says in the X number of year of Tiberius Caesar, when such and such was primate in Syria, whatever, whatever it is, I, I don't have it exactly now, but it gives a very, specific historical reference for when this took place that we can know that Caiaphas was the high priest, Annas, his father, was the super high priest. We can know that Herod was the, um, was the king of the area. He was a puppet king for Caesar. Uh, we know that Caesar was Caesar Augustus at that time. We know that Augustus was proclaiming a time of peace called Patre, P, Pachi Patre, where he was considering himself the Prince of Peace and trying to declare peace throughout his empire and glorify himself. So we have a lot of this together. We know that Herod historically lining the roads into Jerusalem were crucifixes and crosses of anybody that just crossed him or looked at him the wrong way or something happened. He was crucifying people left and right. He was evil. Um, th there's a lot more that when I had, and I, I'd love to, the opportunity to tell you about the illustrations. I'll tell you a short story, but not sure. right now. But I, in one of the illustrations, I had to illustrate what King Herod looked like. And I pictured him as an older guy, older meaning 40s and 50s, sick from within, evil eyes, scrongy beard, royal headdress, but I wrote in many storylines, including when the three Magi would have gotten, they were in someone else's country. You know, I can't imagine the, the prime minister of France coming to America and not going to see President Biden. So I think that's the reason that they went to see him. 
But I think that Herod was a, a, alert. He was a, aware of this star. He had diviners and people and, you know, he must have been seeing this on the roof at night, wondering himself what it was all about. He was a puppet king um, and he was demented. He was known historically to have incredible orgies and to treat his generals to every pleasure imaginable, decadence, food, wine that would last seven days. And this was fodder for great stories. And there are a number of them in there. He he looms as a very, he looms as the Darth Vader of this story. No question about it. And you need that protagonist. And it's absolutely him. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, talk to me about the illustrations. Um, what, so, yeah. when I was writing this, so it's chronological, right? It, it starts 20 chapters. We're, show, we're in, in the early part of the book, we're seeing the Magi seeing something and they're talking about it and they're, and it's astounding them. In the second chapter, we're, we're introducing you to this quiet little town of Bethlehem and some of the people you're going to meet along the way. And in the third chapter, we're meeting Mary, Joseph, and we're hearing all that story and things start moving. You're going to meet the shepherds, how life was in the town, things that happen by about the middle or two thirds of the book, Jesus and Mary are arriving and settling down and having a baby, but it doesn't end for them there. They have to, they have to baptize the child according to Jewish law on the eighth, on the eighth day. Then the angel appears to him and tells him to get Mary out of there. Those children, those innocents were slaughtered and eventually they return. They go to Egypt and eventually they return to Nazareth. That's the story. In my thing, I stretch it a little bit more, but that's the story. So I had envisioned in my mind some pencil illustrations on the opposite of certain chapters to give the reader a chance to visualize this a little bit, not just in print, but something to think about. The, you know, a picture's worth a thousand words. So I had a, I, I had sketches. I did sketches of the Magi seeing the star, young Mary, young Mary in an olive grove, King Herod, the manger scene, the cave, the flight to Egypt. There were eight of them. I had these eight in, illustrations in mind. And it finds out that my publisher couldn't find the talent to do what I was looking for, pencil drawings. And I wanted them on the opposite pages. They, they couldn't find it. And they said to me, Mike, we don't, have the, we don't have the bandwidth to do this. It was early on in the process. It was sometime in July or August. So being pretty resourceful, I went and saw what kind of resources I had. I did some internet research. But, and I remembered a company that I had done some business with and they had a catalog of all their people and their kinds of that. I found this person. I said, hmm, there were a couple of scenes, long distance scenes with buildings and things. And I thought I could talk my way through this, not having any idea where this person was. So I connect with them. I share with them the first illustration. I get an illustration back. We're doing this by internet because I find out that the illustrations for my book were going to be done by a 17 year old kid in the Philippines. Wow. In today's global market, that's where he was. When I went to bed at night at eight o'clock, he was waking up the next morning. So I was sending him directions, sending him illustration, tweaking ones that he did, and then signing off on them, feeding them to the, and we got these illustrations done. And I enjoyed the benefit of <laughs> Filipino wages <laughs> versus, versus American, the American economy. But but I was thrilled with the illustrations and uh, and and uh, I think they add to the book. Great. Um, anything else you learned about um, the story of uh, the birth of Christ that uh, that might surprise uh, a reader or uh, one of the listeners to uh, this very podcast? I think one of the you know other than that the Magi eight or ten days later find Mary and the child and Joseph living in a home. And that encounter takes place on the lower floor of that home. And other than the fact that it's really a cave and with a wood outcropping and certain little things like that that get connected when Mary is telling the story 
of her cousin Elizabeth and how and how she had to break the news to Joseph and her parents and when she was with child. Those things exist throughout the whole book. And I think that may be one of the reasons why people are so interested and feel like they're there because it's there's more detail than the sentences that exist in scripture. And nobody would, not many people would have taken the time to research this historically. Um, but one of the things that I built in, I don't want to give away too much, but I can, I can give up. Early on in the book, there is somebody in the Bible who claims to have written down an orderly account of the birth of Christ. And that's the Apostle Luke. He wrote the book, the Gospel of Luke, and he wrote the book of Acts. And he is a physician. He's a historical figure as much as he's a biblical figure. But early on in Luke, he says, most excellent Theophilus, as much as I had it in mind to write an orderly account of those things which have become surely known among us. And he proceeds to tell the story. Now, for him to have written down an orderly account, he had to do like I did. He had to go to sources. But in his case, he might have gone to many firsthand sources because he was alive during that part. Mm -hmm. So in the book, I interjected that he early on is getting some facts and figures years later from some people that are, that the story is absolutely dependent on. And it's, I think that will be a surprise to the reader when they see that that thread is built in as well. All right. Well, I know the uh, holidays are upon us here, Michael. And uh, as I said before, books make uh, great gifts. So uh, for the listeners of Uncorking Story, you may want to buy your book uh, for either themselves or for somebody on their uh, gift list. Um, where could uh, people pick up the book, Michael? Quickest and best way is Amazon, uh, Amazon uh, or barnesandnoble.com. If you go to um, www.michaelmccarrybooks, M-A-C-A-R-I, michaelmccarrybooks.com. Both of those links are there. So one click and they can buy it. Um, I know that they're still shipping in time for Christmas. Uh, there's primarily a soft cover. I, I have a hard cover that's available for my use, but I think for people to do that or to go to their local bookstore, and just ask them to order it for them. And uh, it's being distributed by Ingram. And I think the store can get it in two days. So uh, I, it's really, it really, really, really is my hope that people discover Christmas again, that they believe again, that it touches them, that they tell the story, that they give Jesus a second chance in this terrible, terrible time that we live in. And I'm grateful to God that I actually got through it and finished it. 30 years later. Yeah. And uh, I mean, I, I'd hate to, to say it, but you might have COVID to thank for that as well. Right. I mean, in terms of giving you the time and, and, you know, to, to, to pick it up again. Just a quick extra thought, Mike, me edit this out or whatever. I got in the video business in 1983 when my musical band had a record contract with Carrie Livgren of the band Kansas down in Atlanta, we were going to go make an album and Carrie Livgren of Kansas, he who wrote Dust in the Wind and Carry On My Wayward Son, was going to produce our band. The night before we did, I got a kidney stone that put me in the hospital for a month, killed the recording project, and three months later put me in the video business. So between COVID and kidney stones, I, I, ho I hope there's not a third. <laughs> Well, they do say things come in threes, but uh, <laughs> hopefully there's a big 30 year gap between another major. <laughs> I'll be an old man. I'll be like John writing on Patmos. <laughs> there you go. Well, listen, Michael, this has been great uh, talking about your work. All the best with the book. And uh, again, people can buy it. Barnes and Noble, Amazon, other local bookstores, of course. Uh, also, bookshop.org is a place where I always tell people to go when you buy something from bookshop.org. It kicks a little bit back to some uh, local independently owned bookstores. So wonderful. Uh, Michael, all the best. And to you and your family, Mike. Thanks for having me.